Dream Truthers, it's Jessica here, and I have another prophetic word for you guys. Um, we kind of got hit with a double whammy, I guess you could say, which is fine. So today I'm recording on March 31st, uh, Thursday, March 31st, and I got this word yesterday um, in the morning. So it was kind of a funny story because... Typically, I'll be spending time with the Lord. I'll be kind of in a quiet, I don't know, um, state and or reading scripture or whatever. And usually that's when I get prompted. But this time was a little different because I was right in the middle of making my breakfast. And I had my coffee cup right under the coffee maker and it was already making it. And next thing you know, I got hit with like a bunch of phrases and words that I knew they just weren't my own because it was just kind of like this it's a totally different voice and it was very much Canada oh Canada I could almost I could hear him saying that so I knew he had something to say so it's funny because sometimes I think he likes to shake up our routines and I'm very much a routine oriented person I don't like change I don't like doing anything different I like doing the same thing and I also really enjoy breakfast. It's one of my, it's my favorite meal of the day. But I had the choice to either just ignore it or take the time and put that aside and just listen to what he had to say. So that's why here we are. So I'm just going to pray and then I'll read it to you. There is a section in here. Um, there's uh, one section in particular I will go over more in detail because it has to do with a, a novel and I and I want to just give it context and there's a lot in it so I'll unpack that after I've read everything so why don't we just jump into it okay so um, I'll just pray here <laughs> oh Lord says pray okay Heavenly Father we just thank you Lord God that we can come to you and Lord God, we just submit this time to you and we posture our hearts before you. And Lord God, we're so thankful that we can do so because of what Jesus has purchased. We thank you that the blood covers us. And Lord, if we've said or spoken or acted out, Lord, um, in sin or against you, Father God, we just ask for and receive that cleansing blood. And we thank you, Lord, that we are made holy and righteous because of Jesus. And we thank you that we can stand before your throne. And we thank you that we're restored to right relationship and there is no condemnation in Christ. And so, Father God, I just thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit of truth, for Holy Spirit, for revealing things to us, for giving us direction and insight and wisdom, and for showing us your plans and purposes and for giving us so much hope. And Father, our hopes are in you. We stand with you. And Lord God, I just pray uh, that you um, we do, that you take control of this tongue, that I just submit it to you. Let every word that's spoken out of this mouth be to edify you, to glorify you, um, and to reveal your plans and purposes. And we just um, take authority over any spirits or any plans or plots of the enemy. Um, that aim to steal, kill, and destroy, Lord, we just abort those plans. We bind them in Jesus' name. We just put a covering and plead the blood upon this video as well as this channel and your people, Father God. And we just thank you for protecting all of us. And there's just kind of a cloak of invisibility. We just pass under that radar and we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your word and we just pray that you prepare your people. And we just thank you that every word that comes out of this mouth be with pinpoint accuracy of what you want to say. Let it all be what you want to say in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Alrighty. Okay. So this one is titled, Daddy's Here and He's Cleaning House. And I got this Wednesday, March 30th, uh, 2022 at 10.03 in the morning. And I'll just start. Thus says the Lord your God, I am he who rules and reigns over your nation. Canada, O oh Canada, the land that I so dearly love, whose rivers abound and mountains cry out, prepare ye, prepare ye, for the Lord of lords is coming. How great is your bounty, how supple are your fruits. Like a nursing mother, you too shall feed 
the nations and bring healing. Your heart of grace, peace, and love shall move, even the most hardened of hearts, for it is by the goodness of me, that's God, that I lead those to repentance. Canada, my Canada, the land of the true, north, strong, and free. I have come down to this nation. I have breathed my spirit into its lifeless corpse. Many mourned you and thought you dead. Many cried in despair, seeking a reckoning. Others mocked and scorned you and thought to take your seat on the world stage. But I said, nay. My people said, enough. If there is one thing I cannot resist, one thing where I cannot turn my face from, it is when the people submit in humility and cry out. I heard every voice, every whisper, and every thought, and it moved me. So I moved and breathed my breath upon this land. The spirit of life moved, and the once dead corpse that they had put in the grave gasped for air and came to new life. Now I say, Canada, O oh Canada, I loose the bonds from you. You once were dead, but now I called you to new life, and live you shall. There is much work to do and much restoration ahead, but now is the time when I roll up my sleeves and clean up this nation. Now is the time I remove the burial bandages and tethers that kept you tied up. So you shall live, move, and have your being in me. I say to you, O Canada, the nation that I love, we have reached the top of the hill. Click, 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 like the coaster that we have been on. We have reached the top, and I repeat, we have reached the top. There shall be a brief pause, and I will announce again, buckle in, buckle in, buckle in. There will be those in the final moments that will, so they'll buckle in. Others who have been ready since the beginning, uh, such as ourselves, but there will be many who have not. They will not see even from the top of the hill. Even when all is clear, the view is the highest, they will not see, and so they shall fall. Down, down, down shall they go into the miry depths in which they were made. Seducing spirits pulled them in, and a harvest is coming to them. I say to you, my children, I say to you as a father of this nation, as one who has not spared anything from you, do not spare anything from those who have persecuted you. There are many Pauls among you, and they shall have their Damascus moment, but I urge you and tell you it is not your place to avenge, ridicule, or correct. Stay away from such talk, and do not think you are above my judgments or my grace. For I say to you, my grace is sufficient enough. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. I am calling on those leaders, premiers, politicians, doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers who were blind and now see to fulfill their destinies. They will want, they will want guidance, help, and they will need my children to aid them just like that of Daniel, uh, Dan of Daniel, Joseph, and others. Excuse me. I have called specific God-fearing children to tend to these leaders, but I am commissioning all of you to not hold a grudge. Not one grain, gripe, or naysayer shall be tolerated, for I have ordained and qualified them. They have not missed their destiny, though they have made poor choices. But I shall vindicate and I shall set right what has been wronged. Canada, O oh Canada, the breadbasket to the world, why do you cry tears of sadness, depression, and carry so many cares? Do not think this is the end, or this is how it will always be. There is coming a day when jobs shall open, and I will break every ec economic tether they have tangled you in. The leeching spiders shall I expose. I am lifting up their rock, and out shall crawl in a frenzy these leeching spiders. But my spirit, like a whirlwind, shall sweep them away. I have anointed you with the oil of joy instead of mourning, and oil shall flow through you uh, once again. 
Every debt shall be paid because you shall owe no man, nation, or deep secret organization. I'm giving those in the dark places a backhand and will stun them so that they shall make world-renowned blunders. Blunders so great the nations shall be enraged for justice. And to the little prince who sits on a miry throne, little Justin, how you have fallen. The world sees who you are and you cannot hide your true colors. Your throne too, you once covered up in lavish gold and ivory, but I have exposed it as the dung heap it is. Like a small dog, you are snarling and snapping at me, but also at your people. They will forsake you along with all your lovers. A disgrace you shall be, but it did not have to be this way. The white witch has fallen from her ivory tower. The twitching and spasms were too much for her. She has laughed her last laugh, and I'm bringing her to justice. Oh, and, <laughs> excuse me. And, oh, Gerald, 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 you who thought you could rule them all. You have set your face against me, and like Nimrod thought you could build Babel in my nation. How audacious of you. You plotted, planned, and schemed in the dark places, but little did you know that your underlings, in their greed, also schemed. All of your plans entangled in one another shall be your undoing, for I am bringing to light your emails, your secret messages, and witnesses. You can try to gag and muzzle, but I am setting up this day, says the Lord of hosts. I am setting up with you, or settling up, sorry. Uh, I Okay, let me read that again. I'm terribly sorry about that. You can try to gag and muzzle, but I am settling up this day, says the Lord of hosts. I'm settling up with you, O Gerald, and you will not escape the harvest that you have sowed. Such depravity and sickness of thought. Lo, has the enemy so made you to defile yourself. There were ten little politicians, but as I count down, so shall you all fall. Fall, 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 you shall all fall until there are none. And I'll explain what that means later here. Canada, oh Canada, what grace and beauty you have. For you have poured out your hearts to me and I have answered. I shall not leave you destitute um, or found wanting and, and in need. No, I shall rebuild you stone by stone and brick by brick. You will flourish once again, just like a maple sapling, so shall you grow. Oops. There shall be new means of money flowing through you, new ways of engineering, building, and manufacturing. I'm speaking to them in dreams. I'm uncovering new ways of energy, efficiency, and building. Oh, Canada, the world will look to you for designs, science, and engineering, and you will not trade it to another. O oh, Canada, you are the land of the free, and those that have been wrongly accused, harassed, arrested, jailed, and imprisoned shall I exalt and lift up. Do not think your law enforcement and courts can run away from my spirit of change, for I am sentencing my verdicts and laying down my orders. There shall be no buts or excuses, for to serve and to protect go hand in hand. One cannot move without the other, and many have sought to protect false kings and priests, but I will reside over those proceedings in due time. The serpent's tail is unraveling and can no longer coil around in a tight vice grip. No, for it shall be severed head first and then cut in quarters. One, two, three, four. I have kept the score, and I call foul. Foul has been at play, but I am sanctioning a gold card, a gold card that shimmers like a rainbow. There will be no timeouts, no more huddle-ups and game plans. There is only one plan, my plan, and I am letting the clock run according to my time, says the Lord God. Canada, O oh Canada, how I love thee from everlasting to everlasting. 
from east to west and north to south. Every rock, tree, and seed shall feel, touch, and know my presence, for I am saturating this land with my glory. Amen. Glory, glory, glory to the highest, for he reigns and rules with a mighty hand and loving heart. What he declares, so shall it be. Glory, glory, glory to everlasting. The creation sings and speaks of his magnificent glory. The trees clap, the waves roar, Oops. and the mountains cry out. Glory of the create the glory of the creator is here the glory of our lord is here thus says the lord god who loves cherishes and resides over this nation do not fret my canada for daddy's here and he is cleaning house amen woo <laughs> so like i said there is a lot in there and there's still so much, um, I guess, so much revelation, so much um, um, that the Lord still has to show us about this one because it's so full of things. So the one thing I wanted to uh, just note, um, because um, there's a lot of words he uses in here and it really, um, it confirms a lot of Bible study stuff that I've been looking at. My dad and I, uh, it's funny because my dad's been really um, inspired to uh, study the book of Daniel. And uh, there's a certain passage in there which reflects, it's the statue. And I know my dad has felt really impressed that that's kind of the time we're living in. There's a section in there where it talks about the, um, the feet and the feet that are made of... Um, uh, clay and I believe iron and then there's ten toes okay and I know um, you know there's so many people that have so many different interpretations and I'm not about to tell like like this is this is it this is these are just kind of things that I think uh, that we believe that the Lord showed us and it's kind of like, okay is this what this is because I think sometimes we um, without events on revealing themselves and when you see the time period we're in it's like okay this is this is now starting to make more sense and it's funny because he's been doing that and then i was uh led to read esther the book of esther especially around the time of of Purim. and there's so much in there just um certain words that i've looked up certain phrases certain the way the time frame is and what's what's all behind it and it really, there's a certain, there's a real relevance to what we're seeing in these stories and how they actually kind of interconnect with one another. And um, I'm not going to talk about that in this, um, I think in this video, because I think it's one of those things where um, I should just cover it in a different one. And maybe I'll just do it as a, as a Bible study one. But if um, I do encourage you to, uh, if I do ever when I do get around to do that but I do I will maybe do that because there's a lot of words that the Lord says in here especially this the word miry and um, there are a few instances in the Old Testament Bible and I believe in New Testament but he talks about miry clay or a miry pit most more so this the idea of this miry clay and it's basically clay or a sludge and it hasn't been purified, it's been contaminated kind of, because you can't use miry clay um, if you're a potter and you have a potter's wheel and you like to create pottery. Um, you need a certain type of clay that's been refined, that's been um, melded and gone through a certain process so you can make it malleable. So it will stand the heat when you put it in the kiln and, uh, and then it'll actually bake properly. You can't use just miry clay without it being refined and 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 so on so it's interesting uh because my um because this words come up again here and there's so much meaning in that word it's kind of a i want to say it's a loaded bible term if i can say that just from what he showed me in my in my recent bible studies and it's kind of reminded me of kind of you know i don't know if you guys watched it or not but it was there it was the whole Deborah uh, and Barak, the warfare one, and how it really um, 
the Lord really showed me. It's like, this is Canada's moment. This is the story that you guys are going to be witnessing here in this nation. So, um, but now he showed me other things. And I feel like it's a bigger scope, what's going on in Esther and, and Daniel. And I think um, there's just so much. And there's even some verses in Psalms where David's actually seen our time. Just the way it's the way he's worded stuff, the what he's seeing. It's like, okay, he's not talking about his situation. He's talking about our situation. Because it just doesn't make sense in his context. But when it's when you see the whole big picture, it's kind of like, okay, so this our time with what the Lord's showing us in, in these in these words, and it's it's huge. Like he's talking about a new era. The kingdom's coming. And then the other thing, and maybe I'll have to ask her for permission, but my mom's had a, a huge um, encounter too. And and really, we've had Jesus come here on earth. He came here. And then the wonderful Holy Spirit's been here with us this whole time as well. But time and time again, just in this word and other ones and just... Um, things he's revealed to me, I really get the sense, and I could be off my rocker, that even the Father is coming down. Like his presence, his glory, he's coming down. And it's going to be so, things are going to change so much because he's coming down personally. I know he said that so many times. But it's not only that, and and he's even mentioned at the beginning of this word and at the end that even creation is calling out to him. Like It's like they're getting ready and they're celebrating already. And I think if we're more in tune and stuff, we're starting to see bits and fragments of how it's like, okay, Father's here. Father, like he's here. Like they are, they're all, they're three in one, but they each have their distinct um, personalities, I guess you could say. And, and they're, they're one whole but they the, there's different facets of them and so far i think the world here is experienced we've experienced we know um through jesus we kind of get a semblance of the father and then through the spirit he's revealed things to us well now daddy's coming down and that's not even a term i use i don't call my my dad daddy i call him just dad and so it's so when i was writing that out I just wanted to say, well, let's just put Lord God because that sounds more official. But he he was so adamant. It's like, no, no, no. It's like you put daddy. Like it's kind of this really personal um, word full of kind of a lot of feeling. Very child, uh, not childish, but it is what kids say. And that's kind of what's happening. So I just wanted to reiterate that, that there's a lot in this and it's just reinforced the certain books of the Bible that I've been really studying heavily. So uh, just a heads up, there's probably going to be a Bible study video uh, that I'll do just because there's so much stuff in here. And it's like, that's like, it's just kind of like, oh, the Lord showed me that in this book and this verse and there's that. So anyways, um, okay. The big thing here is that I wanted to uh, bring context and give um, some more insight in is what the Lord showed me is this it's a very small line a very small line and it's this line where he says um, there were ten little politicians and when I heard that line as I was writing this out um, he brought to my remembrance a time when I was in school and I I honestly forgot about this I like you know when you're it's like you don't you don't remember everything as a kid, but he brought this one to my remembrance. And it was the time when in school we read um, a book and it's called, uh, it's by Agatha Christie and she wrote it in 1939 and it's called And Then There Were None. And I'll give you the whole synopsis, but there's a poem and it's a plot point of that, of that book and, and the whole book centers around this poem. Now, before I start, um, because of the time and the period that this poem was written in and how there's been so many renditions, it is, um, it's very, okay, how do I put this? Um, I'm not about to, okay. <laughs> All right. It's very loaded. Let's just say that. It's a very, it's politically loaded. It's racially loaded. 
to today's standards of what we call what's, um, which are, they're so mixed up anyways, but um, it's very um, contentious, let's just say, okay? Because of the terms that they used and the, the terms that, um, because this poem was written in the 1800s, 1860s, um, they used certain words like the N-word, they called individuals Indians, that's just what they used. And while I can try and cover it up, I'm not about to, okay? Because, um, and I'll make this very clear, my standpoint is um, historically, um, that's those are words that people used. And words can be used in um, the enemy likes to come in, he loves to take us, make our words so that we use them uselessly, so we can hurt people with them, so we call them names, and there's power in that. I'm not saying that there isn't. Um, but I'm not about to just sanitize history so that we forget where we came from, so that we, you know, so that you learn from it. I'm very much that way. Um, our past isn't perfect. It never was been. The human, human history is full of, um, is full of, can be full of, you know, evil and darkness. People have said and done so many terrible things and it's because of the enemy influencing them. But, um but we can't just cover that up we just you learn from it you let god show us it's like okay how can we not do this again and how did you get us through that how did you make it and correct it because he's done that so many times okay so i just want to make that clear i'm not here to um to offend people or to make you upset or mad or whatever the, these are just the words and the terms that they used back then. They didn't know any better because they're saturated in their culture and it's okay with them. It's kind of like your grandparents, my grandparents using certain terms and it's like, well, that's not culturally appropriate nowadays. But they don't know any different because that's just what they grew up in and that's just what they called people and called one another. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just it is what it is. Okay, you can't. You can't condemn people that don't even think it's wrong. It's it's like because it's they're grown up in it. There's terms that we've developed and created in our time that young people use and stuff like that, and it's offensive. And and years down the road, um, or it's not offensive. And years down the road, there'll be people like, well, that's really offensive now. We can't use that, and yet we're still like, well, what? Like, I mean, we use it all the time, you know. So it just depends, okay. So I'm going to just, all right, let's get into it. So let me just get my browser up here. Okay. So the poem in this book is called um, Ten Little Indians. That's just what, that's just what it was called. That's how it was written. Okay. And originally it's technically Ten Little Injuns, like the I-N-J-U-N-S. Okay. So that's just the word that it used. Um, and this poem was written by a gentleman by the name of Septimus Winter. And Septimus Winter was born in uh, May of 1827 and he died in 1902. The thing about him is he was an American songwriter of the 19th century and he went by several different names, but he was very much, um, he wrote um, a lot of different songs. Many of them have turned into nursery rhymes, okay? So just an example of this is the one is the, the song uh, Der Deitcher's Dog, which is that one that's, oh, where, oh, where is my little dog gone? It's that one. So he's the one that wrote that, okay? Just to give you, it's like, oh, he's the one that did that. And it's over time it's developed into a nursery rhyme okay so the um so winner originally wrote this poem uh 10 little engines and you can look it up yourself there's um it's uh it was written in 1868 um, and basically it's just this little poem and it, it's go 10 little engines stand in a line one toddled home and then there were nine and it's basically counts down and these poor little individuals um, get knocked off one by one and from this poem there's been another rendition that came out of it and it's the and um, uh, the generation before me my parents know this song they remember it it's the one little two little three little um, 
engines. That's where, so somebody else pulled that out of it. So it's part of this poem as well. So very loaded poem, um, heavy, heavy historical context, lots of oomph in it. Okay. Then let's just go back here. So this song, 10 Little um, Engines, was originally published in 1864. And then afterwards, it was adapted by another writer, Frank J. Green, in 1868. However, he called it, unfortunately, um, 10 Little with the N-word, okay? Um, the thing with this is, is really interesting, is that this poem became a standard of the blackface minstrel shows. So back in the day, they used to, um, there used to be kind of little pop-up theaters, set-up theaters, and these different minstrels would travel around, and a lot of them would, they would literally paint themselves in black. Sounds like somebody we know, right? Uh, a certain PM. And they would basically sing songs, oftentimes making fun, or just doing whatever and this was one of the popular shows that these these individuals would sing they would sing this song they would dress up the same way and they would poke fun make fun of or um you know that's just what they did okay um so it was sung by christie's minstrels and it became widely known in europe so it starts in europe and then it, um, it also was known in europe where it was used by agatha christie in her novel and then there were none so now let's switch over to the novel because i think it's more the novel that's really important however i don't think it's um i don't think it's a coincidence i don't think it's um an accident i guess that the lord chose this really culturally loaded poem because right now we are uh in the face of um this whole narrative of you know racism is everywhere even if you you don't think you're racist you're racist or um and even our, you know, how our, how our government and how people have treated um, Aboriginal peoples, right? Those uh, broken covenants and relationships that have been lost. And these governments constantly promising these people, well, first of all, dressing up like these people and also making, you know, fun and jest. I mean, I'm sorry, you, you, it's just interesting that this poem comes out of a context like that and it's and it's just like what our pm likes to do he loves to dress up loves to pretend he's something else that he's not and in this guise of you know we want to stand for this we stand for freedom all about you know democracy all about you know helping these you know aboriginal children reconciliation and we stand against racism meanwhile we'll turn their back on it and you know um where, when was it when he was invited to meet certain chiefs of an area and he was at Tofino Beach vacationing and it was it, it was an important thing and yet he just showed his true colors. Anyways, I just think it's interesting that this poem is rooted in this really historically loaded context and we're faced day in and day out with this berated by this narrative that that um and and it's um and it's really uh purported by spirits of division and spirits of condemnation and guilt, right? It's it's trying to make both sides, it doesn't, it, and that's the thing. They're trying to create this whole, you're on one side, people are on the other side. And it's like, no, it's not. We're all made in God's image. He's all made us wonderfully the way we are. Um, do you have different skin tones because of certain pigmentation? Sure, um, that's fine. And in fact, you know, as an artist of somebody that paints and stuff, like we're all made of the same tints and shades and colors. Okay. Um, you all have to get a little bit of yellow, purples, uh, pinks, reds, you know, just to make different colors. So you really, it doesn't matter to me. I could care less. Um, so it's just interesting that you know, the context of how that poem was made, how it was used, and how we're seeing a similar situation again. I don't know. It's just something to think about. Anyways, okay, so this, so the book. 
So the book is, um, when I read it in school, it was titled And Then There Were None. However, let me just go up here. Um, it's a mystery novel that was written by Agatha Christie, and it was written in 1939. It was published by in the United Kingdom by Collins Crime Club. However, it was originally titled Ten Little, and then you have your N-word, um, um, and that's how it was published, okay? Just the way they did it. Then... It was adapted, um, it was then published in the U.S. in the 1940s, and because of the cultural changes, right, they retitled it and re, you know, changed some of the lingo, so that was called And Then There Were None. And the poem that's typically used, um, because it starts out with, you know, it's it began as Ten Little Indians, went to Ten Little... Um, the N-words again, and then um, it switched to Ten Little Soldiers, Ten Little Teddy Bears. It went, it's just flip-flopped all the, all around, okay? Um, so the edition that I read was titled, and then there were none, and it used the Ten Little Soldiers. That's how it was, um, that's how I remember it. Um, anyways, I'll give you kind of the plot if any of you haven't read or heard or watched the movie okay so the plot of this book is eight people arrive on a small island it's an isolated island off the Devon coast each having received an unexpected personal invitation they are met by the butler and the cook housekeeper Thomas and Ethel Rogers and they explain that they're the ho that the hosts um, are Ulrich Norman Owen and Una Nancy Owen, but they haven't arrived yet, um, though they have left instructions. So a framed copy of an old rhyme hangs in every guest's room, and that's this poem. And on the dining room table sit ten figurines, which um, in our version I think it was ten little soldiers. Other versions that had the, the ten um, native figurines. After supper, a phonograph record is played. The recording accuses each of these visitors, along with Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, of having committed murder. Then it asks them if any of the, these prisoners at the bar wishes to offer a defense. The guests discover that none of them know the Owens or... Um, and Mr. Justice Wargrave, who's one of the characters, he suggests that the name, um, this Ulrich Norman Owen, is actually just an abbreviation. It's a play on words for unknown. But if you look at it, it's the capital U, then you have your capital N, and then Owen. All right? So it's unknown. And I just think it's interesting. It's, you got your U... Un, your UN unknown. Anyways, Marston, one of the other characters, finishes his drink and he promptly dies of cyanide poisoning. And then it continues on that each of these characters, one by one, they get picked off. And somebody on this island um, is basically murdering them. Very, yeah, not pleasant, okay? However, I'll go through the list here. So... Um, so the main characters are, these are the characters. So you have Anthony James Marston, and he's an amoral and irresponsible young man. You have Thomas Rogers, the butler, and Ethel Rogers' domineering husband. You have Ethel Rogers herself, and uh, she's the cook and housekeeper. You have General John Gordon MacArthur. He's a retired World War I war hero. Emily Carolyn Brent, an elderly pious spinster. Edward George Armstrong, a Harley Street doctor. William Henry Bloor, a, a former uh, police inspector, now private investigator. Philip Lombard, a soldier of fortune. Vera Elizabeth Claythorne, a young woman on leave from her position as a sports mistress of a girl's school. Lawrence John Wargrave, or Justice Wargrave. He's a retired criminal judge. And then you have Isaac Morris, the island's owner. He's a sleazy lawyer and drug trafficker, okay? 
So the story then, um, as each of these characters basically are murdered uh, by the way the poem is laid out. So if we read the poem, and I'll just quickly read the poem here, um, the soldier boys one anyways. Ten little soldier boys went out to dine. One choked his little self, and then there were nine. Nine little soldier boys sat up very late. One overslept himself, and then there were eight. Eight little soldier boys traveling in Devon. One said he'd stay there, and then there were seven. Seven little soldier boys chopping up sticks. One chopped himself in halves, and then there were six. Six little soldier boys playing with a hive. A bumblebee stung one, and then there were five. Five little soldier boys going in for law. One got in chancery, and then there were four. Four little soldier boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. Three little soldier boys walking in the zoo. A big bear hugged one, and then there were two. Two little soldier boys sitting in the sun. One got frizzled, and then there was one. One little soldier boy left all alone. He went out and hanged himself, and then there were none. Okay. So, it's a very gruesome story, but it's, again, it's Agatha Christie, and you're trying to figure out who, who did it. So, the thing to keep in mind is, um, <laughs> is, um, when I started reading each of these characters, so there's ten of them, and I think that number's relevant, not entirely sure how, but... So there's 10 of these characters, and it's interesting um, how each one passes away, but the more interesting part is the accusation, the reason why they're there. Because the whole plot of the story is one by one, these characters are picked off, okay? And the actual person that has been murdering them, and I'm going to spoil it because it needs to make sense to you guys, is Justice Wargrave. He's the retired... Um, uh, a criminal judge and during the whole um, episode here he's actually if I read it right give me a second um, so certain uh, people you know have been murdered so after Wargrave su suggests searching all the rooms La Lombard's gun is found to be missing Vera Clay uh, Claythorne goes up to her room and screams when she finds seaweed hanging from the ceiling most of the remaining guests rush upstairs. When they return, they find Wargrave still downstairs, crudely dressed in the attire of a judge with a gunshot wound to the forehead. Dr. Armstrong pronounces him dead. However, Judge Wargrave never was actually shot in the head. He just faked it, and he got um, Dr. Armstrong to play along with him. So he's actually still alive all this time. So one by one, he picks them off. Then... When the last person is um, um, hangs herself, um, the Scotland Yard officials arrive on the island to find nobody alive. They discover that the island's owner, a sleazy lawyer and drug trafficker called Isaac Morris, had arranged the invitations and ordered the recording. However, he had died of a barbiturate overdose on the night the guests arrived. The police reconstruct the deaths with the help of the victim's diaries and the coroner's report. They are able to eliminate several suspects due to the circumstances of their death and items being moved afterwards, but ultimately they cannot identify the killer. Much later, a trawler hauls up uh, in its net a bottle, and this bottle contains a written confession. In it, Mr. Justice Wargrave recounts that all his life he had two contradictory impulses, a strong sense of justice and a savage bloodlust. He had satisfied both through his profession as a criminal judge, sentencing murders to death following their trial. After receiving a diagnosis of a terminal illness, he decided to put into effect a private scheme to deal with a group of people he considered to have escaped justice. Before departing for the island, he had given Morris a lethal dose of the barbiturates for his ingestion. He had taken, he had faked his death by the gunshot with the assistance of Dr. Armstrong under the pretext that it would help the group identify the killer. And then after killing Armstrong and the other remaining guests and moving objects to confuse the police, he finally committed suicide by shooting himself in the head using the gun and some elastic 
to ensure that his true death matched the account of his stage death recorded in the guest diaries. Wargrave had written his confession and thrown it into the sea in a bottle in response to what he acknowledged to be his pitiful human need for recognition. Okay, I know, it's very gruesome. However, it's interesting because let's look at the ten characters and and these are people that escaped justice according to Justice Wargrave. But it's interesting how there's ten of them and how what they did in their lives to kind of escape justice. So you have Isaac Morris and he's the island owner. And he, his, um, I guess you could say his accusation was he sold illegal drugs to a woman who became an addict and later committed suicide. I find it interesting because you have a lot of people in deep, dark, secret even politicians themselves that have a hand in these illegal drug trades with border crossings and all kinds of sense. I mean, we're, we're right in the middle of a fentanyl crisis here in Canada, especially in Ontario. There's certain cities that have just been wreaked by it. And these individuals, um, they don't care what happens to these people that get addicted to it. All they care about is making money. So it's interesting. You have one facet, you have the, these, um, you know, kind of the drug trade, that's one facet that's been really polluting our nation. You have Anthony James Marston. He knocked over and killed two young children while recklessly speeding. I think it's interesting because you have somebody that's in a rush for themselves, this selfishness, speeding recklessly. It's not about, you know, the whole speeding, but it's this that he's more important and so he'll just kill young children. You have We have a huge abortion problem problem it's, it's it's yeah um mrs ethel rogers so this is the uh the housekeeper anyways she allowed herself to be persuaded by her husband into withholding a former employer's medicine in order to collect an inheritance sound a little familiar with what's been going on and how people have been Restricted, they haven't been get, uh, they haven't had access to life-saving surgeries, uh, certain medications, certain medicines that could help them. Um, especially if you're in a nursing home and you need that. Nope, you don't get any of that. Like you, people have been persuaded not to help because of a certain narrative going around. So that's interesting. General John Gordon MacArthur he ordered a young officer to undertake a mission where he almost was guaranteed to be killed. And when MacArthur accidentally found out the man um, was having an affair with his wife, so you have um, just, yeah, this messing up with the, let me just make sure I got the right person here. He is, yeah, the World War, he's the World War One hero or whatever, but he's not really a hero. It's just all make-believe. It's, you know, it's kind of like these, um, so-called um, decorated heroes and, and generals and stuff, and yet they're so not doing what <laughs> they should be. I mean, there's a few good eggs, but most of them, it's like they're just as crazy as the rest, and they're following a narrative. Um, and they're supposed to be protecting this country. They're supposed to be your military, not used against you, and yet here they are um, allowing people to be young officers to be killed, leaving them behind, and then, you know, holding grudges and stuff. Anyways, you have Thomas Rogers. He, and this is the butler with the wife withholding medicine um, so that they could collect an inheritance. You have em uh, Emily Carolyn Brent. She dismissed her teenage maid for becoming pregnant out of wedlock. The dismissal caused the, maze, uh, the maid to drown herself. So we have a, once again, it's this, these, um, these so-called women and purporters of, of women's rights, women's freedoms, this whole narrative that they care about women, and yet they really don't. It's kind of a, it's a, um, I don't know what you call it. It's a weird spirit behind it. And there's certain individuals in our government in the U.S. as well, and they purport that it's all for women's rights. It's all for women's rights when it's so against it, when you're, they're so belittling this whole, um, the honor it is to have kids, 
the and rather than helping them helping save both the mom and the kids providing solutions providing them with homes and, and a way to help them it's like just get rid of it just kill it just it's it's not necessary convenience is more important think about your career right you have a, a lady of a house when she finds out her maid has gotten herself into this awful situation like you know awful in the sense that she can't provide for it um, and just dismisses or doesn't even lend a helping hand. Um, it's just interesting, okay? And then we have, you know, Lawrence Wall, um, Wargrave, the Justice, uh, Justice Wargrave. He improperly influenced a jury to bring in a guilty verdict against a man many thought to be innocent and yet sentenced him to death. Well, we've had a lot of, there's a lot of different stories and narratives of people who've been hauled up. I mean, the, um, the, the insurrectionists that are still in jail, you have other people that have, they bring up these trumped up charges against people and it makes no sense. And they're just trying to harm them and, and just do all kinds of things, lock them away and, and ruin their lives just because they come against their narratives. You have Dr. Edward George Armstrong. He was responsible for the death of a patient whom he had operated on while drunk. Well, I think it's interesting how we have had a lot of physicians, not all of them, but a lot. They've been drunk on this whole narrative of, you know, of um, only one way, only one thing you can do, only one shot, one shot. You just get it, just get it, you know, this is, and that's it, like not even not even questioning the signs, just following along, protecting their jobs, not, and pay, people have been harmed, people have been hurt, you know. And then we have um, William Henry Bloor, he gave perjured, um, perjured, sorry, evidence in court resulting in an innocent man being convicted, sentenced to life imprisonment and dying shortly afterwards. Again, it goes with this whole corrupt court system that we've got going on. You've got Philip Lombard, um, and he was a soldier of fortune, and he caused the death of a number, the deaths of a number of East African tribesmen after stealing their food and abandoning them to their fate. I think that one's also really interesting because I think there have been a lot of, um, historically, a lot of past grievances, especially with our, our um, Aboriginal communities, our, our covenants have been broken, and um, two, I think we can become a little hard-hearted when it comes to that because um, I, I'm, I'll even admit myself, um, I, I got a little tired because it's just like the system, what we're doing, just throwing money at these old wounds is not helping. And and kind of getting a hard heart that they're uh, that it's this idea that it's like well they're just always asking for money they never work for themselves and and you know the Lord's been so gracious to show me that it's like um, that it's not all what it seems like I think we're gonna start seeing more of the past be revealed to us what really has and I know there's been little fragments and bits as to what's happened in these residential schools but I don't think we know the bigger plan that was at play at that time and I think we're gonna uh, there's gonna be more truth and there's gonna be more light shed upon that but I think to um, the Lord's really gonna move in and not only heal and and help us um, like give us true reconciliation like godly reconciliation which which honestly restores renews um, recreates you know like it's so many times we've heard that word and it's man's it's man's attempt at trying to reconcile and yet we're so broken we're so tied up in selfishness we don't even know how to do that we don't even know where to start our our solution is just throw money at it as if that helps as if that solves anything and, um, and so I do honestly believe that the Lord's going to, he's coming down here. He's going to move. His glory's going to shine. He's going to reveal things, bring things to light and bring about true reconciliation and true healing because so many people in the past, um, have been hurt. But two, I think this whole idea that, um, uh, and the condemnation that's been put on people, it's like, well, how can I pay for 
sins that have been made and I don't even know who my ancestors are where they came from like we don't even know like it just you could continue on to it's like well are we going to make the Italians pay us stuff because of how they treated Christians when they were Romans like are we going to go that far like it there comes a point where it's like the Lord's got to come. He's got to bring true reconciliation. He's going to correct the situation. What we've been attempting at doing, just it just makes it worse, okay? And with the God, he's very good at healing both parties. He doesn't do it in condemnation or guilt, you know, like, um, and that's another thing the enemy likes doing. It's like, in order to reconcile, we have to make one other party feel bad Meanwhile, it's, and, and that they have to hate themselves, they have to hate where they came from, they have to hate who they are. Um, you know, Eastern European descendants are terrible people no matter what you do, where you came from. They're just evil colonizers, and it's just like, that's not the truth, okay? Um, so God's gonna do a big work on that. Um, and there's just so much of the enemy has been at work, but I just think it's interesting that you have a character here Apparently, he's a soldier of fortune, made a lot of money off of um, the deaths and the hurt that have been done to these, um, in this context, East African tribesmen and abandoning them. And I think there's going to be more revelation um, as to what's really happened and, and how to go forward with, with, with our past, right? With Canada's history. Like all nations, they have a history. Not always good. But it's like the Lord said, it's like, I'm going to take your dark past and I'm going to, you know, shine light and I'm going to make it new, right? So that people, it's like that the traumas, that things that have been done will be restored. It's all good. And then the last person is Vera Elizabeth Claythorne. And she's the last person um, to be murdered in the novel. And she was a governess, but she allowed her young charge to drown so that his uncle could inherit the family estate and marry her. So, um, I know this may seem like a long shot and it seems kind of ridiculous because it's like, why would the Lord use this novel? It just seems like a terrible murder novel and it's your typical Agatha Christie, but it's interesting because she said, or it's been noted that this was the mo this was the most difficult novel she had to write. And I just think it's really interesting how the Lord's showing here. We know he's going to correct. Um, there are things that have been happening in our nation going on for so long. Um, the, um, the abortion problem, the mentality, the spirits behind that, the, the, um, how it's, it's not for women's rights. It keeps women in the dark about their true functions, their reproductive functions, knowing how their bodies work, knowing the consequences when you make certain choices. And even if you make certain choices, there are still other avenues, you know. Um, life does not have to be lost at the cost of convenience. And this, and, and so you have, anyway, so we have that. You have, you know, people being trumped up on, um, or people being thrown in jail and accused of things from trumped up charges. You have um, terrible trafficking and people making money off of that. And just, um, I just think it's interesting how there, these 10 characters reflect di uh, different aspects of our society. You have law enforcement, you have courts, you have teachers, like the governess, like um, um, you have, um, what other ones? Sorry. Um, you have the, uh, medical, um, medical, the doctor. Um, and then I believe there's just other ones. Oh, the war heroes, the military. They're all, it's just really interesting how there's all the, these 10 characters and there's different facets of our society represented and the crimes that they've committed, it, it's, we are seeing them today. They, some of them are still hidden, but it's interesting how, um, how, um, what they've sown and it's kind of like the Lord um, in this word. It's what they've sown. It's, and I know sometimes we can get on the boat of, well, it's God's judgment and God wants to punish. And God, no, God's heart, and he's made this very clear, 
um, especially through Jesus, is that none should perish. And like he said about little Justin there, it didn't have to be this way. Justin could have made so many different choices. God could have got involved. It could We could have had a totally different outcome and still can at this point. But it's what, what they say, their actions, what they do, and the enemy has an influence in that. And basically they sow these things. They sow discord. They sow strife. They sow hurt and harm and violence. Um, and eventually... There's a time where you do reap a harvest, and it it's it it it's not a good one. It's a harvest of judgment, unfortunately, and it's and it's just the way this this world's been set up and created. You know, in in a perfect realm in God's kingdom, when there is no sin, when there is no condemnation, when there is no death, it it all you would reap is goodness. All you would reap is His goodness. But because sin has entered into this ro- world. There's two options, and he's always telling us, you know, choose life. Choose life. He gives you the answer. Choose that. And some of us don't, and I can't understand why, um, especially people that know who God is, and yet um, and yet they still they still hate him. Like, it, I, I can't understand it. I don't need to. And you pray that they do um, figure it out here. But anyways... So that's the whole egg of the Christie novel with this whole um, the ten politicians, and I think there's going to be, I think there's been a lot of stuff going on. There's been a lot of corruption, and um, over the years in this nation, um, even since the beginning of it, there's been stuff going on. Let me just see if I can pull up my thing here. Boop. Anyways, okay. Um, so that's kind of what that one section is. And I know it's, I know it's the poem and all that is so loaded with stuff, but there's a reason why. And I think it's, and we're kind of seeing it now with how, how there's been this whole craze, right? There's been this whole craze of social justice, fighting everything, everything, you know, you know, you're insensitive about it. And I just think it's, it's just interesting. It's something to think about, something to just to get to, um, to make you ponder and stuff. But um, I don't think it's an accident. There's a reason why the Lord pulled that from my memory bank because I I couldn't have remembered that story. But there's so much in it. And it just, when I was reminding myself and reading over the plot, it's just like, oh man. And each of these characters and what they did and how there's, they each represent a different facet of society and what we've seen, what we've, we've seen our own leaders, we've seen people of influence do these things. Um, and it's just like, this is crazy. It's just like, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, so I know that was a very lengthy explanation. And we kind of went down a little rabbit trail there. But uh, take what you want from it. I found it really interesting. It kind of brings to light. It's like what we're, what we're really dealing with and kind of um, where these people are at, you know. And I don't think... Um, I think we can really easily fall into like, yeah, they deserve it and judgment and stuff. But really, you know, God wants, his heart is that he created them. They are, those are his kids. Those are his creation. He breathed life into them. And he, they don't need, um, they don't, he doesn't want judgment to come on them. He wants, um, he wants what's best for them. And he's so good to just let people have their will, their choices. They can do what they want. Um, but it is sad. It is, it, it is, it's, it's sad you don't wish that on anybody. And it happens to people because of their choices. It's really unfortunate. But it isn't God who does it. It's not God who wants that to happen. Um, it's just the way, um, you know, if you ever get the chance, Robin Bullock explains it the best, um, the whole... Um, Yahweh and he's the it's the facet of God that's seed time and harvest and it really um, kind of obliterates that sovereignty message that so much of us try to cling to when things don't make sense to us when we don't get the big picture Um, and so if you ever get time just check him out because it's it's very good Um, anyways I think that's everything 
I think that's all I can really cover. But um, I do, <laughs> I don't mean to end off on a sad note because there's so much exciting. There's so many, like the Lord says, um, there are going to be people that are going to have their Damascus moment, just like Paul. We're going to see lots of Pauls here. And, um, and it's going to be exciting how he's going to turn things around. He's changing things. He's already done so much. There's still much to do, but it's all very exciting. And things are not going to stay the way they are. I know people are very upset about gas prices and oil and energy. And these are the things that are bogging us down, but it's nothing to worry about. God's got this. So, um, yes. So thank you guys for tuning in. I really hope that that word especially um, lifts you up and helps you. And I don't mean to get too off track, but I did think it was interesting how the Lord kind of used a novel, one, <laughs> one that I didn't even remember. Um, and that there's just, um, it's interesting, you know, I don't know what else to call it. Anyways, okay, so you guys have a wonderful day, and thanks for tuning in, and um, I'll be sure, we'll see how uh, things go here with certain school projects, but um, we'll be sure to do a kind of a Bible study video and explaining, um, or just revealing what the Lord showed me about certain things that I've read in certain verses, because it's all um, just mind-blowing, okay? Anyways, all right, have a wonderful day, guys, and many blessings, and, um, and thanks for tuning in. 